Sonny Burke, you have been producing Frank Sinatra's records, along with a lot of other things, for a number of years now. That's right, Bill, I have. I don't produce all of the things, but I produce a good many of them, and uh, I'd say that I've had the pleasure of working with Frank closely for the past seven or eight years, and I've found it to be a thoroughly delightful, enjoyable, and a most rewarding experience. Well, what you have to say there is what many other people have said in print and uh, in person. And I get the feeling that this isn't the sort of thing that's being done just to say it and just because he's an important man and an influential one. The impression I get is that it's something that people mean when they, when they say it. For one example, I've met a number of associates of Sinatra's all of whom have been associated with him for many years. The associations, the relationships go on for a long time. Bill Miller, 19 years as a companist, right. and so on. I think I can better sum up what I had intended to say by putting it very simply, and that is that Frank is the pro of all time. It's been my experience during these past or a good many years, let's put it that way, to work with many professionals as well as a lot of very, very capable and, and talented amateurs. And the best way that I can say it is that there is a tremendous difference between the pro and the amateur. I don't mean to be deriding them. I think that everyone at some time or his life, some time or another in his life, naturally had to start, start out being an amateur. In Frank's case, he is completely the professional's pro. He knows what he wants. He prepares very, very well for it. In effect, he trains like a, like a fighter would train for an important bout. He learns his material. He has a preconceived idea of what he wants to hear, what he expects to hear what he wants to hear from himself, the results that he wants to get from the tape. And when he comes into the studio, he's there to work. He, it's, a, it's a business day. He really works. And uh, I, I would wish for so many of the young people, uh, I'm not confining this only to the young because the amateur status also applies to people of all ages, but I, I only wish that a good many of them could have the privilege of being in a studio with Frank and watching how a real pro works. This is, is something special, and it, it, it should be a required course once a year for anyone who has any doubts about himself at any time. I know uh, Bill Miller told me that when Frank is going to perform, he vocalizes the same way an operatic singer does for half three quarters of an hour before he performs and I've known a lot of pop singers and I've never known one to do that. Somebody was telling me the other day about a rock group that's being recorded, a new rock group that's being recorded in in town. I forget what label it was even but I recall that they were preparing an LP that they had had I don't know how many sessions. They had gotten three sides taped so far and they were into the recording company for, at that time, $47,000, which is a considerable chunk of money. And I suppose this is, in a way, what we're talking about when we're talking about pros and amateurs. Yes, that's, exa that's exactly right, and it's one of the areas that I was referring to when I talked about what a marvelous thing it would be for some of the people recording today to be around to dig Frank when he works. Uh, to develop the, the pro thought for a minute. You're quite right about the vocalizing. Uh, not only does he vocalize for uh, a goodly time before coming into the studio, but on a, on a project that he's involved in, he vocalizes every day and really trains, as I said before. He uh, gets plenty of rest. He lives very conservatively everything primed and aimed toward that recording. And uh, 
he comes in, he has a feeling of the tempo that he wants, and if the conductor for any reason misses that tempo, he, he uh, advises him about it and finds the right tempo. He's concerned about the shading of the orchestra. He listens very carefully for uh, different tone colors that are coming from the orchestra, has ideas about what to bring up, what to de delete, what to take down, uh, has uh, probably the greatest feeling of all singers for a lyric. It's one thing to sing a lyric. It's another thing to, to speak it as well while you're singing it. And that's one of the things that makes Frank's renditions of, of songs so important today because he's a lyric writer singer and that's something that is really rare. Um, when he sings the lyric to a song, it's entirely believable because he has been living that song for a number of weeks, rehearsing it finding the approach to it, finding the key to it. And uh, when he delivers the song, that's the very best he can do, which is the name of the game, really. Uh, along the same line, Frank could very probably have been one of the world's great conductors if he'd had the musical training. He has an amazing pair of hands. His hands say more with just a just a slight movement than 10 minutes of talk to an orchestra. If sometimes he's, he's trying to convey to the conductor a certain feeling he wants, he will unconsciously conduct. And every, every gesture, every movement is so articulate and so expressive that the orchestra has no, no troubles for, for any short span of time in, in getting the feeling that he wants because his hands tell the story. I, I would imagine that had Frank gone to the conservatory and studied music seriously, the world might have lost one of the great singers of all time, but the world also might have gained one of the great conductors of all time because he's got a tremendous innate feeling for music and expressing himself musically, and above all, expressing the music that was composed by the man who wrote it. He has that marvelous ability to place himself in the, in the position of the composer, and he performs and probably would conduct a, a great orchestra with the closest thing that the composer might have had in mind when he wrote it. He's also got another quality that great conductors have always had, and it's, uh, it's the eyes. Any great conductor has very uh, powerful eyes, and this is also a characteristic of Sinatra. That's very true. Um, he also has one other element, as long as we're talking about Sinatra, the conductor. The musicians sense immediately that he knows what he's doing. And the communication is instantaneous and complete. No words spoken. It's a mutual respect kind of a thing, I guess. They know that Frank probably respects music, musicianship more so than any other phase of our artistic endeavors. He really digs musicians. He's loved musicians all his life. And I think the, f the feeling goes across the, the barrier between the conductor and the, and the musicians in a instant fashion with Frank. It's a, it's a feeling of electricity somehow or other. And the electricity isn't meant to convey tensions because there are no tensions working with Frank other than that everyone is performing to his very best because he performs. His, his rehearsals are, are performances. He, he doesn't throw anything away in the studio. He's there to work. He's a working musician when he, when he sings. He expects that from the orchestra. 
and they know that he expects it and they in turn show their respect for his musicianship by performing to their best I, I hope I'm not getting complicated when I discuss this but I, I know what I'm trying to say I hope you and your audience will too it's a, a great feeling of mutual respect I think is what I'm trying to say I find it interesting that you say that there are no tensions beyond those uh, normally associated with the quest for perfection because Sinatra is one of the most uh, written about and probably one of the most miswritten about people in the public eye is not the sort of person uh, who the public generally would uh, expect somebody to say that his recording sessions were without particular attention because most people in who read the newspapers and magazines get the impression of Sinatra as a person with a quick trigger temper and when anything's apt to happen at any moment the picture you're painting is of a very different sort of person entirely also you know the picture that's painted in the general press is not that of a hard-working person you're probably quite right and uh, it's a pity that that so much of the miswriting goes on when really th those people who are in their livings as writers could do much better for themselves to to write the real thing instead of what they imagine to be the real thing naturally there are tensions in a recording studio uh, Frank himself is tense but that's that's an artistic tenseness that's like the football player waiting for the whistle to blow and the and the ball to be thrown the minute it's over then he's completely in the game and, and the tensions, those early tensions disappear. The musicians are tense, the conductor is tense, and I must admit with all the hundreds upon hundreds of records that I've made in my life, I'm still tense when I go into a recording studio and it doesn't let up until the three hour session is over with. But that's as far as it goes. Uh, I wish everyone I had ever gone into a recording studio with was as great to work with and for as Frank. Uh, Frank is, is uh, at all times understanding of, of the problems involved in bringing about a good recording. And if I labor the word respect, please forgive me because I, I really mean that and I'd like to develop it for just one more step if you don't mind. If those with whom he works have the talent that he knows they have, and have the respect for their own craft that Frank has for his. There are no problems in a studio with Frank. He knows exactly what he wants to hear, and uh, above all, he respects honesty. If you hear something that is less than Frank's best, you call it to his attention, and he knows that that's a, that's a sincere and very honest opinion and he uh, accepts it very graciously. I don't know of a single time in all the records we've made together that Frank has ever been anything but gracious and uh, very considerate, very warm and friendly to the people in the recording studio. Who chooses the material and how is it done? As you can well imagine, material for Frank is sent in by every songwriter in the world. He's still the number one songwriter's singer, as I mentioned before. Any guy or any team with a great song would rather have a Sinatra performance, I imagine, than anyone in the world, because they know they're going to get the truest possible performance of their material from him. To uh, go a little bit further, songs are sent to all of us who are close to the recording picture with him. Those songs are screened from a standpoint of the projects we have in mind or the projects that have been uh, set aside as go projects and they're sent to Frank finally and he listens to everyone carefully, throws out those that he doesn't care for or doesn't especially want to do at that time and the final judgment is made by Frank I read 
in one article that even the order in which the songs are placed on the record is something of importance to him in, in the package as the record's finally finished. That's quite true. On the albums that I make with Frank, I pick up from the end of the recording, do whatever editing is necessary, and program them according to the way I I see them programmed from a matter of pacing and time. That is the various times of each each of the songs to conform pretty much to an evenly balanced pair of sides, A side and B side. And we make up a stereo reference tape for Frank in that order. He listens to it, has certain ideas about changes. Sometimes he approves of it the way it is. Sometimes he has an idea for a change and refers it back to us. We make those changes and send him another tape. And finally, he, when he approves it, then we go to press. I thought it might be nice to follow this interview with a few recorded selections of things that have particular meaning for you. If you would care to pick a few out of your head and remember them and think what you would like to have put on following this interview. I'd be glad to do that. And uh, I think that probably the first thing I would ask you to play from a standpoint of what I consider to be the complete package, by that I mean the singer being Frank, the conductor arranger being Gordon Jenkins, and the songs being what they are, I would respectfully suggest that you play anything out of September of my ears. I think that probably from, a, from the concept of the album completely through all the processes toward the finished product, this one package stands out in my mind as one of the best all-around weddings of the artist and the material. And uh, I believe that Gordon did a spectacular job in framing those little works of art for Frank with the orchestra. It really does have a special place in my heart. In another bag, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the best spontaneous performances I know of involving Frank on records is the Sinatra at the Sands package with Count Basie. It was a remote recording under something less than the most desirable conditions because of the placement of our recording equipment and uh, an open stairwell and countless chorines and comics and stagehands going back and forth and all the little things that can happen on a remote rec recording. However, I do think that the overall sound of the package not to mention the performances of both Frank and Bill Basie's marvelous band. An another good all-around package. And if you'd push me to recommend a third, I had very little to do with this, so I feel very free in, in recommending it. I think the Concert Sinatra is really one of, one of the great works on records. If you recall, this was done with Nelson Riddle and a large orchestra and chorus, and every song a gem. And uh, I don't know of a greater group of Sinatra performances that are contained in one package. If you push me some more, I've got a half dozen other recommendations. Well, we'll, we'll put something uh, from each of the albums that you recommend here. They, they certainly would be among my choices, too. Good. The September of my years, I think, is the best. Uh, the best album, uh, there's only one album that he made that contests with it, to my mind, and that's one that he did uh, before Reprise was even a gleam in his eye. It was an album called Only the Lonely, which is 
the only one that, to my mind, is in the running uh, with September in my years. I would agree to that. Sonny Burke, thanks very much. My pleasure, Bill. Thanks very much. I enjoyed it.